1994. Today is my first day of writing the new Star Wars series. I'm all set. All I need is an idea. The fact that it's so anticipated allows me the freedom to sort of be creative in the way I'd like to be creative and not have to worry about what people think. You know, because on one level I'm going to get slaughtered uh, no matter what I do, and on the other level, you know, some people will like it. Twenty years ago, Star Wars The Phantom Menace was released in theaters all across the world. The day was May 19th, 1999. This marked the return of the Star Wars saga. George Lucas was bringing back his franchise to the big screen with a brand new trilogy. Star Wars Episode One became one of the most anticipated films of all time. The first big day for Episode One was in September of 1998, when George Lucas announced the title, The Phantom Menace. The title would be the first disappointment fans had with the film. Star Wars enthusiasts assumed the name would be either Balance of the Force, Guardians of the Force, or The Clone Wars. Fans even began to believe George Lucas would change the title a few weeks before the release of The Phantom Menace, just as he did in 1983 with Return of the Jedi. But the excitement for Episode One exploded in November of 1998, when Lucasfilm released its first trailer for Star Wars The Phantom Menace. The trailer was shown at 75 theaters in the United States and Canada. Star Wars fans would pay full ticket prices just to see the trailer. You actually paid to go in to see a movie just to see the trailer and then you left? Yes, because it's an awesome two and a half minutes. For one showing at a theater, about 500 people showed up, only for over 300 of them to leave after the trailer ended. The second trailer for The Phantom Menace was an even bigger event. It was posted online in March of 1999. The trailer was downloaded over a million times in the first 24 hours and grew up to 6.3 million downloads within three weeks. And this was before the time of YouTube and the modern day internet. As the days grew closer to the release of episode one, the anticipation continued to build. Well, it's a marketing dream. Almost 400 people lined up in the cold drizzle at midnight to be the first to get their hands on the new Star Wars merchandise. As Peter Clemente reports, it's just the tip of the iceberg of the interest generated by the soon to be released movie. On May 3rd, 1999, the Toys for the Phantom Menace went on sale. It was called Midnight Madness, a night where Star Wars fans would wait for hours outside just to buy the toys for the newest film. You got enough stuff, do you think? Uh, no, but I got a limit. I spent $324. 320 $324. But that's nothing, because I just ordered myself a Han Solo frozen in carbonite from North Carolina. Uh, 227 I believe. Yeah. Was it worth it? Uh, I guess so. If, it, if it's worth money, I it guess it's there? worth it, yeah. How big a Star Wars fan are you? <laughs> On your cell phone. Yeah. Darth Vader was the first action figure my dad ever got, and it's the first movie my dad ever took me to see. How old is so, that? So this one, this one's for you, Dad. This one's for you. 100 bucks. Me, He's gone. Me, gone. Me, this is the one for my personal collection. Those are the people I hate, because I, I was at Toys R Us at midnight. 1201 when they were selling those toys and people like that grab like eight or nine of those figures they have the bad that everything's got to be perfect and then they go and they sell them for like 30 or 40 dollars and that's the reason why star wars fans like me cannot get what we want star wars was known as a toy empire the toys generated more money than the films and made it a hollywood tradition to release toys alongside every summer blockbuster by 1999 this was the biggest merchandising campaign in cinema history Toys R Us had sold over 1.25 million units of The Phantom Menace on May 3rd alone, Darth Maul being the most popular toy. Two days later on May 5th, George Lucas changed the release date for Episode 1. Instead of releasing on May 21st, George Lucas had the film released two days earlier on May 19th. George said changing the release date was to give fans a head start on the film so they could watch it during the week and families could watch it over the weekend. This move showed the confidence George had in the film and meant fans would be able to see the film even earlier than expected, making the anticipation continue to grow. There was simply too much hype for the next Star Wars film. Fans waited outside theaters for hours just to buy the tickets, and then waited for days in line until the movie was shown. It would be an understatement to say that people were looking forward to The Phantom Menace. This was an event across the nation that everyone was talking about. An estimated 2.2 million people took sick days off in America, costing the US economy $293 million, 
This was a movie to define a generation of fans. Star Wars, the ticket menace, the hype machine surrounding the new Star Wars movie is now in full gear. If you have to ask why, then you would never be able to understand the answer. Star Wars is why. It's kind of like Star Wars, all over, the original, A New Hope, all over again for my generation. We thought we'd try to, um, try to recreate that hype, but on a much bigger scale for The Phantom Menace. It's going to be one of, the, one of the many wonders of the world. There are now eight wonders of the world, one of them being this, this movie. This is a huge deal for me. Uh, I was sick from school today. This is the movie event of the decade. That's why we're here, all of us. Perhaps one of the most anticipated and most hyped, hyped films absolutely ever. Now, will it live up to that hype? Well, these fans say, who cares? It's Star Wars. Well, it's Anacolicious. <laughs> Okay. How sweet it is. Yeah, it's very, very <laughs> tasty, especially with these tickets in my hand. I've waited since 1 o'clock in the morning for these babies. They're sweeter than Anakin Skywalker. I don't expect it to live up to the hype unless Jesus bursts through the screen and comes back. Uh, it'll probably be a letdown for most people. I just want it to be a good movie. I grew up with these movies and the re-releases and everything. It's just always been a, a big part of my life. I was five years old and went to go see Return of the Jedi with my father. And uh, it's just an experience. It's more than a movie. I've been waiting 15 years since Return of the Jedi came out to see the prequel. There's no way it's going to be a disappointment. Are there any of you that think this is going to be a lousy movie? I have to ask you guys is that some of the reviews for this movie have already come out and they're mixed. They're not all saying it's going to be great. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't trust reviews. I don't trust reviews. I got to form my own opinion and I'm sure everyone will vouch for me because reviewers don't know anything. What are you going to do if the movie really sucks? <laughs> Uh, probably see it again. We're talking Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. It opens tonight at midnight. And getting in to see the premiere isn't easy. First, people had to line up to buy tickets, and now they're lining up to get good seats. 16 years we've been waiting for this. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. For some people, seeing this movie is just short of a religious experience. But did it live up to its billing? And this is a new phenomenon to actually line up for tickets to an event that doesn't happen, to a movie. I mean, concerts maybe, but this is a movie and it's going to be around a long time. And we were talking earlier, Star Wars isn't a cult thing, it's what, more a phenomenon? I think it's more of a phenomenon. Star Trek with the Trekkies, that's mm -hmm. kind of a cult. But uh, this spans generations and people want to take their kids, so it is an event. The atmosphere in the theaters was electric. Fans cheered when the Lucasfilm logo appeared on screen. Excitement reached its all-time high when fans saw the opening crawl to the newest Star Wars film, May 19th, 1999. The Phantom Menace had officially released. Now over the past 20 years, there's been some debate about how people reacted to The Phantom Menace. There are those who say the film was loved by audiences and didn't receive the online hate until many years after the film was released. Others would argue that the people hated the film the day it was released. You'll find that both of these positions have some truth to them. The first reviews of The Phantom Menace came from film critics, who shared the reviews before its May 19th release. Critics who went to the early screenings warned fans what they said would be a major disappointment. The Empire Strikes Out was the start of one review, claiming the film was joyless and would disappoint the most die-hard Star Wars fans. Entertainment Weekly put out 11 critical reviews from the top critics around the world. Of those 11, 4 were positive reviews, 2 were mixed, and 5 were negative reviews. Common critiques from the critics included the acting in the movie, notably Jake Lloyd as young Anakin and Natalie Portman as Queen Amidala. Critics felt a lack of engaging emotions throughout the film. The special effects were praised by everyone, but some noted that while The Phantom Menace looks visually beautiful, it lacks any real story or character that connects with the audience. It's a pretty good bad film, as one critic said, a statement that seems to have followed The Phantom Menace for the past 20 years. May 19th, 1999. Earlier that morning, BBC had a headline that read, Fans rave over Star Wars. Later that same day, the headline changed to, Fans have mixed feelings over Star Wars. In Los Angeles, the film was received poorly by fans, with one telling a BBC reporter, Everyone has a lot of mixed feelings about it. It was a good movie in terms of special effects, but in terms of storyline, plot development, and character development, it wasn't. The Phantom Menace did receive a substantial amount of praise in other parts of America, like New York, where audiences loved the film. I think that little Anakin Skywalker, and everyone's going to say it, stole that movie. It was amazing. It was everything I thought it was going to be and more. It had good effects. I'm not too big on the acting, but hey, that's just me. Overall, our informal survey of 19 people after the midnight show tallies up this way. 10 loved it, 
Seven liked it or thought it was okay. And two are no longer Star Wars fans. I mean, I don't want to bag the movie, but I really didn't think I cared about the characters. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Um, God, I'd put my feet up if I could. Thumbs way down. You didn't like it? No, I, I think I deserve a public apology from George Lucas. Fans and audiences praised The Phantom Menace for the special effects. The new planets in the film look stunning. It had the first ever fully CGI character in film history. That character was the infamous Jar Jar Binks. Meant to be the comedic relief of The Phantom Menace, Jar Jar Binks was a goofy character with a goofy walk and a heavy accent. Older fans and critics hated the Gungan, who would go on to be one of cinema's most hated characters of all time. The strong reactions to the character were due to his heavy accent and goofy walk, and he was what many people called an annoying character. Some critics even said the character of Jar Jar was a racist one. Within two weeks of the film's release, Jar Jar became a debate among film critics and die-hard Star Wars fans alike, even leading to the recreation of a website called Jar Jar Must Die. People who despised the character claimed the racism came from his Jamaican accent and that the ears of the Gungan character represented dreadlocks. How in the world you could take an orange amphibian and say that he's a Jamaican? I mean, even the idea of taking his ears and calling them dreadlocks is kind of a strange stretch as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's completely absurd. Despite the early reviews from the critics that loathe the film and the mixed reception among Star Wars fans, the film, of course, was a financial success. It made over $28 million on its opening day, which beat the previous record holder, Jurassic Park, by $2 million. The Phantom Menace was also the first film to make $100 million within its first five days. Episode 1 would be cemented in culture history. It never mattered how good the film was. The Phantom Menace would always be a movie the world will never forget. During that summer, audiences and Star Wars fans had time to re-watch The Phantom Menace. And as time went on, the film did not receive better reception from the people. Fans and critics alike said the film showed that George Lucas was more interested in the money Star Wars could create instead of the stories, but The Phantom Menace was not remembered fondly. Fans voiced their criticisms online, and some even began to make their own versions of the movie. The most popular fan edit of Episode 1 is called The Phantom Edit. It takes 20 minutes out of the original film's runtime and made Jar Jar more of a silent character who was not in the movie as often. When The Phantom Edit hit the internet, fans praised it for being a better film than The Phantom Menace. Fans began to share it all over the world. They would watch it at home with their other friends and discuss it in online forums. It became so popular that a group called The Phantom Edit Network began to sell copies of the re-edit. No one knew who made this. Even George Lucas was interested in seeing the re-edit of his film. Rumors went around that Kevin Smith made this edit, but he publicly denied this. After seeing that their film was being resold, Lucasfilm warned fans that it was illegal for anyone to sell the Phantom Edit. After this, Lucasfilm said George Lucas lost any interest in seeing the re-edited version of his film. The fan edits of The Phantom Menace can easily be interpreted as criticisms of George Lucas in his latest Star Wars movie. Surprisingly, this negative reaction towards the movie led to a now large part of the fandom 20 years later. The Phantom Edit caught the interest of the internet. Fans began to edit the Star Wars films, telling the stories in new ways, and some would argue the edits improved the movies. Other films have also received fan edits of their own. Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit trilogies have popular fan edits, and other films that have been re-edited by its fans include The Matrix trilogy, The Avengers, and Marvel movies, Harry Potter, Batman, and even Spider-Man 3. All of these fan edits could be considered a product of the Phantom Edit. Would fan edits exist if the Phantom Menace was never released? Did the negative reception towards Episode 1 become one of the main reasons fan edits became popular? It would be hard to deny the film's influence. The Phantom Edit showed that fans could have a continued participatory relationship with the Star Wars franchise in any other film in the future. There is a group of, of um, fans from the films that don't like comic sidekicks. They want the films to be tough and like Terminator and they want to be, you know, real guy movies. And they get very, very upset and very opinionated about anything that has anything to do with being childlike, which the movies are for children, but they don't want to admit that, and or a comic sidekick. They don't want comedy in these movies. George Lucas was well aware of the negative reaction towards the film. Lucas spoke out against the claims of racism. When George Lucas was speaking to a group of college film students in the year 2000, he talked more about the critics calling his film racist. He was quoted as saying, You can't sell newspapers by saying nice things about something. You can only sell newspapers by creating controversies. Critics aren't creators, they're destroyers. And I don't think any creative person will ever argue with me about that. So what went wrong? That became the question for Star Wars fans. Why was The Phantom Menace a disappointment to those who waited 16 years for the next installment in this epic space adventure? It's a common practice for Star Wars fans to talk about the films and debate them. But The Phantom Menace was not like the other three films in the saga. 
Fans began to question the merits of the film and wondered how the franchise went from magic to disappointment. Peruska? Cut. Let's try it again. Did The Phantom Menace fail as a film, or were the expectations simply too high to reach? Lucas argues that the expectations were impossible for any movie to reach. The critics of Lucas and his newest Star Wars film would argue the film is simply bad. Those who are more familiar with Star Wars say that George no longer cared about the story in the films, but only the toy sales that Star Wars can bring. Gary Kurtz produced the first Star Wars film and Empire Strikes Back, and his legacy in Star Wars has gone unnoticed by most fans. But film critics and fans who study Star Wars credit him as one of the fathers of the franchise. Kurtz did not work on Return of the Jedi, which critics noted the movie clearly had a lighter tone and was more toy-driven compared to the other movies in the original trilogy. I thought he should have died in the last one, uh, just to give it some bottom, some... Uh, did that not go over well with George Lucas? George uh, 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 didn't think there was any future in dead Han toys. <laughs> <laughs> did Gary Kurtz predict the newfound focus in Star Wars? He stated in an interview about his departure from the franchise, I could see where things were headed. The toy business began to drive the Lucasfilm empire. It's a shame. They make three times as much on those toys as they do on films. It's natural to make decisions that protect the toy business, but that's not the best thing for making quality films. You weren't there at the beginning. You don't know how good it was, how important. This is it for you, this jumped up firework display of a toy advert. People like you make me sick. What's wrong with you? A common critique of The Phantom Menace is its merchandising focus instead of story. Was this purposeful by Lucas? Was Star Wars now profit driven? A counter-argument would be that Lucas was simply meeting the fans' demand for Star Wars toys. It became a part of the Star Wars experience, and fans loved the toys. No one said they had to buy the toys, but fans, of course, did. The most difficult part is to not go too far, just go strange enough. Yeah. That's the biggest trap people fall into in these kinds of movies, is they, just, they go too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sadly, some of the actors in The Phantom Menace were negatively impacted from the backlash towards the film. Jake Lloyd played young Anakin Skywalker. Critics and fans alike panned Jake's acting in Episode 1. Jake retired from acting a few years after The Phantom Menace was released. Jake was bullied in school for his role in Star Wars. He said kids would make lightsaber noise and tease him nonstop. They wouldn't let it go, so you know how they can be in high school. They're so charming and intelligent. Ah, uh, awesome people. Jake was the center of a highly criticized movie. This led to his disdain for having the cameras pointed at him. When you have something like that, there's a lot of expectations for it to be, for that, for it to, for it to meet the standards of an older, pub, older public, and uh, I don't think George did that. The, the stories were meant for kids. I mean, have you met a kid who really hates Jar Jar Binks? <laughs> Ahmed Best played the infamous Jar Jar Binks. Star Wars was Ahmed's first major film. Sadly, the role did not give him the breakthrough career people would expect from starring in Star Wars. Though Ahmed does not regret the role of Jar Jar, the disdain people had for his character negatively impacted his life. Fans that were upset with the Phantom Menace and Jar Jar would send Ahmed death threats and messages saying he ruined their childhood. It's doubtful that one movie could ruin a fan's childhood, but it's also doubtful that Ahmed is to blame for his character's bad perception. A big criticism of the Phantom Menace was the character Jar Jar and his forced humor, or lack thereof. As the prequels went on, Jar Jar was shown less and less. But when he first appears in the Attack of the Clones film, you can see the Gungan weak at the camera. The working title for Episode 2 was originally Jar Jar's Adventure. This was all George Lucas showing his unique sense of humor to the fans. That's great. It's gonna be great. That's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Gonna be great. That's gonna be great. Episodes 2 and 3 came out years later, wrapping up the Star Wars prequel trilogy. The prequels were not the movies fans had hoped for. Was it the rough start of The Phantom Menace, or was it the older fans who didn't understand George Lucas and his vision for Star Wars? Jar Jar is a key to all this. Lucas wrote and directed all three of the Star Wars prequels. Because of this, fans could easily point and blame him for the failure of The Phantom Menace. Lucas offers many rebuttals to this. A commonly debated one is the films were meant for kids. You know, it's hard for people to realize, and I'm not supposed to say this, and I wasn't supposed to say it then, but, you know, it's a film for 12-year-olds. There may be some holes in that argument, but Star Wars has always captured the innocence of childhood in us all. The Phantom Menace did not capture the childlike wonder in the adults who watched the film. But George Lucas and many others believe The Phantom Menace did its job with the children who watched it. The kids could have found no fault with Jar Jar, and loved seeing the newest Star Wars film. Maybe George really did make a movie for kids. 
but critics argue that the kids could care less about the abundance of politics that The Phantom Menace focuses heavily on. Fans have wondered how George would create a masterpiece with the original trilogy. But yet The Phantom Menace was a Star Wars film that received more negative feedback than any other film in the franchise, excluding the holiday special. But why was this? Lucas was returning to the director's chair after a 20 year long hiatus from directing, but this was not by choice. Ron Howard revealed in a 2015 interview that he was approached by George Lucas to direct the prequels. Lucas also offered the job to directors Steven Spielberg and Robert Demeskis. All three of these legendary and famed directors turned down the offer and told Lucas it was his child and he should be the one to direct the films. Ron Howard said Lucas didn't necessarily want to direct the prequels. Perhaps Lucas had no other choice but to direct the films himself. Ironically, Ron Howard eventually directed a Star Wars film almost 20 years after Lucas offered him the director's chair. It's fun for Star Wars fans to now wonder how episodes 7 through 9 would have been like if George Lucas had made them. But we also wonder what the Star Wars prequels could have been if George Lucas brought in one of those three legendary filmmakers who have created some of cinema's greatest films, notably alongside Mr. Lucas himself. Let me ask you a question. Were you seriously thinking of not directing uh, Star Wars? Which, this one? When we were all saying, oh, George, you gotta direct it yourself, and you, oh, I don't know. No. Well, I was always going to come back. Well, how come it you was... put us all through that? We all... Because I'd like to torture you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were always going to direct it. Well, I didn't know whether I was always going to direct it. I mean, it really depends on where I was. And I wanted to come back and direct. I didn't, you know, I... I you mean, we're talking about the this one, one coming out. For a long time, he was saying he yeah. didn't know that he was going to direct it. And all of his friends were saying, oh, you got to direct it. You must do it yourself. Blah, blah, I got blah. a lot of attention. In the year 2005, Revenge of the Sith was released. This was the final installment to the prequel trilogy. Lucas had predicted after Episode 1 that fans would hate Attack of the Clones because of its love story, and Episode 3 mostly due to its darker tone. He was right about Attack of the Clones, but fans and critics loved Revenge of the Sith compared to the previous two installments. With the conclusion of the prequel trilogy, and presumably the Star Wars saga, The Phantom Menace faded into history. One of, if not the most common critique of the Star Wars prequels, is their over-reliance of CGI. Lucas was the first director to use digital cameras instead of filming with a standard film. Jar Jar being the first fully digital character led to iconic digital characters like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean, and many other digital characters in the past 20 years of cinema. While The Phantom Menace may have not been the film loved by all, its impact on cinema and its use of digital technology changed how films were made. Sadly, this historical change in how we create modern day movies has never been linked to George Lucas and his innovative mindset when creating the prequel films. The poor fan reaction to the prequels, and specifically The Phantom Menace, overshadowed the extraordinary impact it had on cinema. It's painful, it's scary, and a lot of things, and you need somebody there to hold your hand and say, look, I'll take the blame. If this doesn't work, I take the blame. And that's why I've always done it on my own movies. I remember meeting Liam Neeson after he'd done one of the Star Wars movies, and he went, Robin, I don't know anymore, I really don't want to act. I've given up, I don't really think I can. I think because I've just spent time looking at an X. I don't know what it's about anymore, really. I've trained to do lots of amazing things, but now I've just been looking at an ex for a long time. And if I saw him, I went, oh no, they've gotten poor Liam. Dear God, dear God. The fans of Star Wars have always been a major key to the success of the franchise. These fans show their passion through their own creative ways. This became very apparent nearly 10 years after The Phantom Menace. In 2009, a movie called Fanboys was released. The story is about a group of Star Wars fans in 1998 who travel across America in order to sneak into Skywalker Ranch and see an early viewing of Episode 1. Fanboys was made to pay homage to the Star Wars fans of the late 90s, and Star Wars fans in general. The biggest critique for the film would be that if you aren't a fan of Star Wars, you likely will not enjoy this movie. But even George Lucas gave this film his seal of approval, even allowing the film to use the original sound effects from Star Wars. The film is a fun watch for any Star Wars fan, and can give the modern day fan a sense of the fandom 20 years ago. Fanboys ends with a group of friends attending the midnight release for The Phantom Menace. The last words of the film were, Hey you guys, what if the movie sucks? Two years later, a more controversial Star Wars fan film was released, The People vs. George Lucas, a documentary that covers the culture behind the fandom of Star Wars, but also covers the problems fans had with George Lucas over the years. It has been remembered as a controversial documentary in the Star Wars fandom. The title alone makes fans feel like the premise of the film is to attack Lucas and all his faults. In the film, fans and celebrities alike talk about the lead-up to the Star Wars prequels and the reaction to The Phantom Menace in 1999. 
It also covers at length the frustration fans have with George Lucas's refusal to release the original trilogy as it was seen in theaters. Instead, he opts for his controversial special editions. A common debate in this documentary as well is if the art belongs to the creator or the fan. The art in this case being Star Wars. This documentary perfectly captures the questions and debates among Star Wars fans that they still have to this day. One can wonder if Lucas has ever seen the documentary. If he hasn't seen it, he is well aware of its existence. David Prowse, the actor who played Darth Vader in the original trilogy, was featured in the documentary and has not been allowed to a Star Wars event since because of his involvement. The People vs. George Lucas mostly shows the build-up to Episode One and the reaction of the audiences and fans. If there is any curiosity as to why the fans that grew up with the original films felt like The Phantom Menace was a step backwards, this fan film shows just that. I almost got hornswoggled in that documentary where I, they weren't calling it the people versus George Lucas at the time. But I could tell from the questions they were asking me, they were, it was an open invitation to trash George. And I have issues with George, but I love that man. I would never, you know, and I don't talk outside the family. The fans of the original films had to wait over 15 years for a new Star Wars film. Episode one was meant to bring Star Wars back. Was The Phantom Menace really the best Lucas had to offer? The People vs. George Lucas is about the problems that fans had with the creator of Star Wars. What are the problems that fans actually had with the film? What are the problems people had with The Phantom Menace? There are plenty of reviews on YouTube by Star Wars fans that can explain the complex feelings for The Phantom Menace, but none of them have reached the popularity of the Mr. Plinkett reviews of The Phantom Menace. Star Wars The Phantom Menace was the most disappointing thing since my son. I mean, how much more could you possibly fuck up the entire backstory to Star Wars? Made by the channel Red Letter Media, the Mr. Plinkett reviews are perhaps the best summarization of the problem fans had with the film. Originally released in 2009, the Mr. Plinkett Phantom Menace reviews quickly rose to popularity and gained much praise for its critical analysis of the infamous movie. The character Mr. Plinkett spends 70 minutes analyzing the Phantom Menace and talks at length about the problems within the film. Plinkett covers the poor plot structure of the movie, bad characters, lack of clear protagonists, and the movie having four different story endings. This review has inspired many other videographic film criticism channels and videos all across the web. After this, Star Wars fans began to point to the Plinkett reviews for the best explanation as to why they were disappointed with The Phantom Menace. The reviews became an internet legend and the gold standard for film analyzing on YouTube. Mr. Plinkett blamed the failures of The Phantom Menace not only on Lucas, but on those around him who worked on the film. A common criticism of The Phantom Menace is that George Lucas had too much control of the film. I take it yeah. you say action after we roll camera. I'll say action. You don't. No, Some, like sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I forget. People, people forget that. <laughs> If I forget to say action or cut, just step in and say action and cut. Which is actually what Lucas preferred. George Lucas has never been the common Hollywood director. If you study the work of George Lucas, you will begin to understand how his creative control impacted the film. Lucas both wrote and directed The Phantom Menace, and anyone who has studied Lucas will know that he is not the best writer. Lucas himself admits this, and he doesn't consider himself to be the best director either. The shortcomings in the writing of George Lucas have always been the characters and the dialogue, something even modern day Star Wars fans commonly acknowledge. Today fans believe The Phantom Menace would have been a better film if George had not written the script, and perhaps they're right. Lucas seems to focus all his attention on the special effects and looks of The Phantom Menace instead of the story. Was The Phantom Menace hindered by its creator's complete creative control? That's what seems to be the common takeaway from fans and critics alike. Some, like Mr. Plinkett, blamed those around Lucas during the creation of The Phantom Menace for not challenging him on some of his decisions. When watching the behind-the-scenes documentary, you can see some people aren't entirely comfortable with challenging Lucas creatively. You can see here everyone is mostly silent and offers no input for Lucas over the casting of Anakin Skywalker. But once he left the room, everyone gave their thoughts over the casting choices. Because <laughs> he seems more natural. I, mean, I like his body language. Yeah. He's just not trained. And this one just hits the beats. Yeah, I was gonna say, some people audition real well. This is not the first time people on set felt the presence of George Lucas as intimidating when filming a Star Wars movie. During the filming of Return of the Jedi, director Richard Marquand talked about the struggles of filming with Lucas around. He was quoted as saying it was like directing King Lear with Shakespeare in the next room. It may be hard to critique a man who created Star Wars while on set of the next Star Wars movie, but film critics argue that George Lucas strives on adversity in collaboration with other creative minds. The original producer of Star Wars, Gary Kurtz, once said, I think one of the problems Lucas has now, in the Lucasfilm Empire, is the fact that he doesn't have more people around him who really challenge him. Kurtz was not a fan of The Phantom Menace. 
The writer of The Empire Strikes Back and now two other Star Wars films, Lawrence Kasdan, seemed to be taken aback from the film as well, stating once, I was at the screening of The Phantom Menace, and it was just so different, and I really didn't know what to make of it. It had no connection in my mind to what we had done. Your eyes are just like, what? How does this work? Even when Lucas originally saw The Phantom Menace, his reaction is quite telling. It's bold in terms of jerking people around, but I may have gone too far in a few places. After the first rough cut screening, Lucas accurately predicts the reception of the movie. But it is a very hard movie to follow, and at the same time, I've done it a little more extremely than I've ever done in the past. It's stylistically designed to be that way, and you can't undo that, but we can diminish the effects of it. We can slow it down a little bit so that <clears throat> if it's intense for us, yeah, we don't know what I'm you know, a regular person's gonna go nuts. In February of 2012, The Phantom Menace returned to the big screen after being away for 13 years. Its return marked the beginning of a 3D re-release of the Star Wars saga. Each film would be re-released in 3D at theaters every year until all six had been released, and the first film in the lineup was The Phantom Menace. With the name Star Wars attached to it, the re-released films would be a guaranteed financial success. The reception of the 3D version of the film fared far better compared to its original release in 1999. Fans were still disappointed with Episode One and the 3D re-release didn't seem to improve the film in any way, except for one scene that all fans agreed was greatly improved with the addition of 3D, which happened to be the pod race scene. This man of menace, motherfucker, in 3D! This motherfucker is empty! Later that same year, George Lucas would sell the rights of Star Wars to Disney. I realized at some point I needed to retire, and I wanted to go on and do other things, uh, things in philanthropy and doing more experimental kind of films, but I couldn't really drag my company into that. He was no longer in charge of the franchise. Fans wondered if the backlash towards the prequels, notably Episode One, was the reason he never returned to direct and decided to sell the franchise. You go to make a movie and all you do is get criticized and people try to make decisions about what you're going to do before you do it. You know, it's not much fun and you can't experiment. You can't do anything. You have to do it a certain way. If that truly is the case, if Lucas sold Star Wars because of the backlash towards the prequels, the question can be asked. What would have happened if The Phantom Menace was a film everyone enjoyed? Would Lucas have kept the rights to the franchise? But as time passes, the stories of old become a part of history, and history is remembered differently by those who experienced it. It's accurate to say, the experience that the younger generation of Star Wars fans had with The Phantom Menace differs from the experience of the original trilogy fans. Older fans had their reasons for not liking the new film. Before an entire generation of fans, the prequels were the Star Wars movies that they grew up with and the first one these kids were able to see in theater happened to be The Phantom Menace. The prequel trilogy is now given credit for its creation of a now beloved show in the Star Wars fandom, Star Wars The Clone Wars. The show takes place during the prequel era of Star Wars, after episode one and two, but before the third film. Clone Wars was created by Lucas and other talented minds like Dave Filoni, and now that the show has ran for six seasons, it's returning for its seventh season in 2019. Many fans believe this has helped improve the story of the prequel trilogy. For the kids who grew up with the Star Wars prequels, and years later were able to watch the Clone Wars show build on those same stories and characters, the Star Wars prequels are films they enjoy and love. The creator of the Planket Reviews, Mike Stoklasa, once said in an interview about the prequel trilogy, I just think that the prequels will evaporate from history, while the original films will remain relevant for a while to come. The new films failed to create any iconic, memorable imagery, and it's all very forgettable. The fans may have proved him wrong. Over the past five years, fans have noticed the prequels have grown in popularity and appreciation. The Clone Wars brought back fan-favorite characters like Darth Maul from The Phantom Menace, and now the character has returned on the big screen with his appearance in Solo, A Star Wars Story. These appearances occurred because of the character's popularity. After The Phantom Menace, fans have wondered the prequels would be better films if Maul had lived. But Maul had made notable progression in terms of character and exposure due to the new stories he's been involved with. Where did this new appreciation from the prequels come from? Some people have always been prequel fans since their original release. But now that it's been 20 years, the fans that have grown up with the prequels see the merit in the films, and even argue that they're better than the fans of old give them credit for. I always thought of how I might redo the prequels, and I wanted to know how you would do them. How would you do the story your way? I would have done it exactly as George Lucas did it. <laughs> Any other answer, hit me on the internet. <laughs> you can see the fandom's newfound appreciation from the documentaries of the films like The Prequel Strike Back. Small communities in the fandom have also voiced their love for the films. 
These communities have put out theories on the prequels, like the Ring Theory, or Darth Jar Jar Theory, that have become popular in the Star Wars fandom. Today, fans feel ashamed for the treatment certain actors received after the backlash towards The Phantom Menace. Mainly, the harassment that was targeted at Jake Lloyd and Ahmed Best. Jake Lloyd was unfortunately arrested in 2015, and is now in a psychiatric facility where he's diagnosed with schizophrenia. His life sadly taken down a different path than what everyone had hoped for him. His co-star Ahmed Bess went through a lot of struggles as well. Ahmed talked about his attempts at suicide due to the harassment that he received. Thankfully for Ahmed, things seem to have improved in his life, and he's often said that given the chance, he would do it all over again. In April 2019, Ahmed Bess attended the Phantom Menace 20 year anniversary panel at Star Wars Celebration. He received a standing ovation from the fans. Other actors like Ewan McGregor, who played a young Obi-Wan Kenobi in The Phantom Menace, have spoken out about the newfound appreciation of the prequels, saying in an interview, George Lucas wanted to do something very different with the prequels. That's why people felt cheated. It was upsetting when people would laugh and joke about it. Now, many years later, the prequels mean a lot to the generation that were kids then. So from smirking, cynical opinions, now I'm getting feedback from the kids they were made for. I'm really happy about that. If there's one thing fans of the prequels and even the critics can agree on, is that Ewan McGregor is one of the best parts of the new trilogy. 20 years after The Phantom Menace, he's a fan favorite character, and there's much demand for a standalone film about the character, with Ewan McGregor reprising his role. Star Wars is a history of what if scenarios, and one question fans will always ponder is what if The Phantom Menace was a better film? What if audiences loved the film like they did for the original Star Wars trilogy? If there was no backlash towards the prequels, perhaps George Lucas would have never sold the franchise. He mentioned in a recent interview with James Cameron his plans for the Star Wars sequel trilogy if he had kept the rights to Star Wars. What he notably mentioned was that the fans would have hated the films, like they did with The Phantom Menace. If The Phantom Menace was the first Star Wars film released instead of A New Hope, would Star Wars still have been a culture phenomenon? China's first Star Wars movie was actually The Phantom Menace, not the original in 1977 that the rest of the world was able to enjoy. This led to a more interesting perspective on Star Wars for Chinese audiences. They did not share the same experience of growing up with the original Star Wars trilogy, and therefore did not have any nostalgia or fond memories of Star Wars. The Phantom Menace was a fresh start for the Star Wars franchise in China, and it did not perform well. Episode 1 only made $4 million in the Chinese box office. 20 years later, Star Wars still struggles to capture the attention of the Chinese audiences. This easily could be due to the original trilogy not having the same culture impact on China like it did everywhere else in the world. The Phantom Menace disappointed Star Wars fans that eagerly awaited a new Star Wars film. It also disappointed Chinese audiences who wanted to see why everyone spoke so highly of Star Wars. Different movies appeal to different people. In 1977, Star Wars was a different movie that changed how people look at film and how they made it. In 1999, George Lucas created a different Star Wars movie, one that pushed the envelope of digital technology and is credited as the birth of digital filmmaking. 20 years later, we still feel the impact that The Phantom Menace had, not only on Star Wars, but in the world. Jar Jar is cinema's most hated character, but he's also the first fully CGI character. The Phantom Menace sparked a community of fan edits that's still going strong over 20 years later. There are now thousands of fan edits for Star Wars that would not be possible without the Phantom Edit or the Phantom Menace. Characters like Darth Maul are still fan favorites and are prominent in Star Wars to this day. Fans have been asking for Ewan McGregor to reprise his role as Obi-Wan in his own Star Wars standalone film. Appreciation for the Phantom Menace has also grown, likely because the kids who watched it are now more grown. In a few years, the Star Wars fandom will be made up of fans who grew up watching the prequel trilogy. Their perception of The Phantom Menace is a lot different than the previous generation of fans. These younger fans did not see the original trilogies in theaters. They had no expectations for the film. Now that they've grown up with the film, it's natural to be nostalgic for it. Will the generation of fans growing up with the sequel trilogy repeat history? In 20 years, will The Last Jedi or The Force Awakens be looked upon with a newfound appreciation? Today the fans of the prequels will admit the faults in its writing and dialogue. Most fans now agree that George Lucas had too much control over The Phantom Menace, but they also argue that he gets too much hate for the prequels. The year is now 2019. Star Wars Episode IX, The Rise of Skywalker, will be the final installment to the Skywalker saga. This marks the end of the story that began with The Phantom Menace. I think George Lucas, he started this out as a nerd, making space movies that him and his friends can relate to, that he loved writing, it was his passion. And I think the more it went on, and the further popularity and fame it gained, the more demand and pressure it was on him. And I feel like at some point, it just wasn't fun for Lucas to make movies anymore. They haven't liked any of them, really. And yeah. they especially haven't liked the last two. So, well, exactly. hey, 
you know, I mean, it can't get any worse. <laughs> yeah, but come on. I mean, when they go after your writing, your directing, it has to hurt. Oh, it always hurts. It has it, to hurt. It hurts a great deal. But part of making movies is you get attacked. The Phantom Menace is now 20 years old. Never again will a film be as anticipated as this one. It was truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience to see this movie in theaters in 1999. 20 years later, the film is still not a fan favorite, but it isn't slandered and hated on anymore. Is it just a nostalgia of the film that has modern-day Star Wars fans defending it, or was the film simply misunderstood when released? 20 years later, the one saying that seems to still fit The Phantom Menace best is that it's a pretty good, bad film. <laughs>